Yeah, ultimately we only have control of our own two footprints and those footprints can be just as positive as they are negative. And that's a dialogue, that's a story that's not being told in our society. And, and there's some small murmurings right now about being neutral, like net neutral housing and zero escaping. But nobody's really talking about how positive we can be. Nobody's really talking about what happens when we start working with nature instead of against her. And this project has really showcased the, the strength of working with that partnership for us. For me, it, it really comes, one of the fundamental reasons is our children. And sh showing our children there's, there's a different way, there's a better way that we can live on this planet, meet our needs, but not only meet our needs, improve the ecosystem at the same time. We really wanted to make sure we harvested every last drop on the site. So we built a rain tank that I'm standing on right now, which is built into the patio, so that we could harvest the rain coming off of this outdoor kitchen roof, as well as this rear hip roof right here. So this tank itself is 3,000 liters, and we built it into the ground. So it's actually built out of pond liner, some culverts, and, um, and the patio itself actually enhances that water harvesting effect because it's sloped down towards the drain right here. So this drain is on a, on a slope and angles back towards this side of the tank. The main reason for wanting to store this water is we noticed that our passive solar greenhouse was consuming an enormous amount of, of city water on an annual basis. So we really wanted to try and reduce that or eliminate it if, if possible. And this year we haven't had to use a drop of city water for the passive solar greenhouse. So this little sump pump gets turned on when we need it. And it uh, pressurizes this little green hose that's coming out of the tank, which brings the water around into the greenhouse where we water our, our wicking beds. So on this side of the house, we have about another 20,000 liters that comes off this roof annually. All the water gets collected into that eaves trough and down into this downspout here, which actually comes underneath the stairs and into this feature, which most people just walk right by. They don't even realize that there's a little micro pond right here. It's actually a tire pond. And out of it, we've got some wetland plants that we've collected from around the bioregion. And the beautiful thing with wet, wetland plants is that they naturally clean the water. They provide weed-free mulch which can go straight on the garden at the end of the year. Um, but also we've noticed that there's all sorts of beneficial insects that will go in and actually come in for a drink. So we really wanted to create a good environment for the beneficial insects in our garden. This pond will overflow in a rain event and it overflows into the swale trail, which I'm standing on right now. The swale trail also has a weeping tile going through the bottom of it. And when this pathway gets too full, overflows, it actually comes out over the level sill spillway right down there. So the cistern right here has an overflow, which is a little bit hard to see, but it comes out of the bottom of the tank with a standpipe. The standpipe sets the level of the water in the tank, and it overflows through this pipe on this side of the, the step right here. And it actually comes under this pathway. So we built a catch basin, which is basically just a complicated word for a hole in the ground that was level with the swale going through the garden here. And you'll notice that the, uh, the catch basin actually has a little weeping tile sticking out of it right here. And this is where that overflow gets harvested. We've also got the, the overflow from this swale coming over top of this concrete wall right here, which gets picked up in the same catch basin. And at the bottom of the catch basin, we put in a lens of gravel, which has a high perk rate. Water moves through gravel very quickly. And in that lens of gravel, we put some perforated weeping tile into it. And that perforated weeping tile will pick up all that water and run it at the bottom of the swale trail all the way through this garden here. So again, we're getting that infiltration of water at a very low level, which is encouraging the plant roots to go down. And the path itself, because it's made out of mulch, stores an enormous amount of water uh, in the wood itself. Over the years, we've noticed that these paths are basically worm farms. Um, I've never seen so many worms in any one place as in these swale trails. So we're actually propagating worms. And those worms we found are actually shuttling 
nutrient from the mulch back and forth into the gardens, which is why our, our soil has improved so, so dramatically. The last place we're bringing water into this garden comes from the west side of the garage. So it comes down this downspout right here and it enters into this weeping tile, which is the exact same weeping tile as on the other side of the lower tier of this garden. So this will receive another 15 to 16,000 liters of water annually. These gardens pretty much do not get any city of Calgary water at all. Um, they're totally passively irrigated by rainwater. And one of the things people don't realize about rainwater is that rainwater actually uh, is where we get about 50% of the nitrogen in our ecosystem because of the interaction with lightning and, and water itself. So it's not just getting hydrated, it's actually getting nutrients as well. Next, our uber productive veggie garden, which supplies our family with fresh produce for four to five months. Thinking of water first, the irrigation rates are really low. In fact, um, I need to I need to top water a little bit when I'm establishing seedlings, and then um, only if we have a really dry hot spell, maybe for one one week, maybe two weeks in the summertime. But um, once I get things established, and especially you know into late July, early August, again, the garden is most most of the work is just in harvesting and processing. Um, the bulk of the bulk of what I do is in planning um, and scheduling in the early late late winter, early spring, and then a uh, big chunk of work in the in the spring to get things planted and get things going. But um, for most of the year, we're just enjoying this space. And you can see here that I'm trying to pack a lot of productivity in a small space. So I use a lot of techniques such as time stacking and space stacking. Some examples of the, both of those right here. Um, space stacking, I've got a lot of stuff trained to go up this trellis to take advantage of vertical space in addition to you know, the space that I have in this little raised garden bed. Um, but also time stacking in that I actually got a whole crop of radishes out of this bed before these squashes were big enough to block out all shade from the garden. So those are some techniques I use to get lots of productivity out of this garden. I plant really densely. Part of that is because nature pours a vacuum. So if you don't have a plant in that spot, you're likely to get um, an opportunistic plant growing there. So by planting densely and heavily mulching, I can tend to uh, control what's growing where a little bit better. I also like to mix things up a little bit. I don't have really straight rows of all one crop. And in, in part, that's uh, companion planting to confuse pests and also attracting beneficials. It also has to do with um, keeping my soil covered and not having bare soil exposed. Again, thinking of that soil ecology as like the most important and this is a thing to pay most attention to if you're trying to grow a really productive and abundant garden. Basically I grow things that my kids love and that as a family we, we enjoy eating. Potatoes, acorn squash, nasturtium, another type of squash, lots of pole beans, two or three different varieties, another potato, kale, and sunflowers. Beet, and calendula. I call it giant lamb's quarter. The seed was given to me by, from a friend, but the, the leaves are very spinach-like and they're delicious. Uh, much easier to grow than spinach. I have some tomatoes hidden in here, chard. Over here, parsley, more tomatoes and herbs, carrots, more Jerusalem artichokes, <laughs> Brussels sprouts, lettuce. This is the best sign. Very abundant and prolific plant. A little scallopini. <laughs> I love how on this postage stamp size property, we've um, basically started demonstrating abundance. And to our children, you know, when they want strawberries, they run out the front door and grab them from there. And in the back, um, as, much, as much produce as we can possibly eat for at least four months of the year, even more. Um, and so the land, the land is supporting us, and our children especially are understanding that more so than just going to the supermarket and um, buying something from there.